Welcome to Concordia Theological Seminary and to our lectionary podcasts. Today in the church here, we uh, shift gears. We've been up uh, to the mountain of transfiguration and seen the glory of our God in Christ. And now we come down to Ash Wednesday and the beginning of our Lenten journey. And Ash Wednesday, of course, is a somber day, a day of repentance as uh, it's befitting by the, the name ashes, ashes to ashes, dust to dust. We are reminded of both our sin and our mortality. And so we turn to the Sermon on the Mount and to our Lord's discussion about um, what a life of righteousness and repentance looks like. And so our Lord says in chapter 6 of Matthew, Watch out or beware that your righteousness, so this is the word, what does righteousness look like? Um, this comes after our Lord says, be ye perfect as your Father in heaven is perfect. This means a righteousness which is not simply living by the rules, but it's acting in the way that Christ acts towards us in love and in mercy and in kindness undeserved. But now beware that your righteousness, that you, that you do not practice your righteousness in front of men. And this is really the theme for this section here. Uh, and it really runs throughout uh, the Sermon on the Mount. Uh, the question is, is there it will be an audience for the things that we do. All of our works are seen. The question is, do we want our works to be seen by men and thereby to receive their praise? Or are we living our lives in order to please God, who sees all things? So beware that your righteousness, as you do it, that you don't do it before men in order to be theothenai, in order to, to become a theater. Uh, Shakespeare said, all the world's a stage. And of course, there's a sense in which that's true. Uh, but we don't do our good works in order to be seen by men and then to receive earthly rewards, to receive praise and to, be, to receive honor, but we do things a little bit differently as Christians. And I think when you think about the Christians you admire, they're not the showy ones. They're not the ones who brag about what they've done. You wouldn't believe what I did today. That's not the Christian way. The Christian way is one of humility and meekness, one that allows the other to receive the glory, one that gives the glory to God. So don't do your, show your works that they might be done before God. Why is that? And um, Because if you do, then you will not have a re your reward before your Father who is in the heavens. So the, now maybe we're uncomfortable talking about this, but we shouldn't be. In the Sermon on the Mount, there are rewards. And I think it's a good encouragement for Christians. Because a lot of times as you do things, you wonder, what am I getting out of this? Does anybody know or does anybody care? And I think it's important to know that uh, it doesn't matter what the world thinks. It doesn't matter how the world grades you. Uh, it doesn't matter that you get a plaque in your honor or that you receive some title. What matters is know that our Lord cares. He's your heavenly Father. Those of you who are fathers or you think about your own father's approval, you know this well, how much it means uh, when your son accomplishes something, uh, how much it means to you to have your father smile. And that's the way we as Christians should think because what matters to us, and now this is revolutionary. In the Old Testament, they never called God Patri. They called him Lord. Uh, they called him his Yahweh. But to us, he's more than Lord now because in the baptism of Christ, God is our Father. It's within this context, uh, in between the passages, which are our pericope for today, that we have the Lord's Prayer, where we're invited to pray to our Father. We know that He was Jesus' Father from baptism, but now we pray to our Father, and we seek His approval and His approval only. So now also we talk about Christian piety. So in verse 2, is that uh, when you therefore uh, here do alms, we would say give alms, this is 
giving and charity to the church and to the poor especially, uh, what should be your attitude be? Well, you're not going to solid pace. You're not going to sound out in trumpets. Look what I'm doing. And this is the way the world does it. Um, this is the way Caesar Augustus did it. He, he had a, uh, a great work called uh, Race Gestae, Things Done. And in it, Caesar would trumpet all the things that Caesar Augustus would trumpet, all the things that he had done for the Roman people. Well, not so us. Um, anything that we do is is uh, it's the least we can do. Let's put it that way. And um, this is the way that the hypocrites do it. And, and they do it in the synagogues and in the open places. Now, the hypocrites, we know, these, again, going back to this idea that all the world's a stage, the hypocrite is an actor. He's on stage and he wants everyone to see what a great person that he is, that he might receive praise before men and approval. And with approval comes power and applause. Well, this is not the way that we are to act. And in order that, again, uh, so that they may be glorified. Now, this is the potent word. It's not just honor, but they might be glorified. Uh, they themselves want to be gods. And, of course, we like that, too. We love, in some sense, we all want to be on stage. But that they might be glorified by men. Now, remember before that we want to have our reward before our Father and the world seeks to have the glory of men. Uh, but again, all men, I tell you, they have their, there's that word again, reward. So there's a reward for everything that you do. If you do your good works to be seen by men, well, then that's it. You get your reward, but don't expect anything more. Part of the Sermon on the Mount is to take the long view. Part of the Sermon on the Mount is to get an orientation and a new, different way of thinking. Because the world only sees the now. We see the future. The world only sees the world as it is. We see that the world, we see the world as it will be. We remember that the meek will inherit the earth. All of this is ours already, by the way. The world is ours already. So why would we seek the praise of men when we could seek the the praise and glory and reward that comes from our Father. So verse 3, we build on this theme. And uh, again, when you do alms, do not let it, uh, do not let it be known um, uh, because w what happens is, uh, and then he says, well, how should we think in our own minds about giving? So, this is really a kind of a neat way of putting it. Do not let do not let know your left hand know what your dexia, what your right hand is doing. Now, this is uh, we shouldn't run around in circles in our minds on this. It simply means we should not take ourselves too seriously. That we should not meditate on our own works that we should not sit and bask in our own glory. But and this is, over here it's about being seen by men in verse 2. Here it's really the way we think about ourselves. And it tells us, let's not think too much about what we have done because what is this but it's self-absorption? So we might give and maybe we don't even, uh, and it, nobody sees it even, but then we say to ourselves in a self-satisfied way, Wow, we're really good people. Aren't we wonderful people? Aren't we kind and generous people? Again, that's simply another version of selfishness. So when you give, so it is that, again, when you, when you, so that your alms, which are in secret, crypto, cryptic, your Father in heaven, your Father who sees in secret, who blepo, in secret will give it to you. So know that the Father, again, don't be discouraged because the Father is watching you and is pleased with you as you do what a son or a daughter does. So we go from alms and now we go to prayer. Again, this is a section about piety. Therefore, when you pray, 
Again, don't be like the hypocrites. There we go. Don't be like the hypocrites, uh, the actors. Uh, in what way? Well, they love, again, to be seen in the open places. They love to be seen in the synagogues and in the wide areas and to pray so that everybody can see them so that they might appear, they might shine, so they might shine before men. But again, I say to you, if you do that, it really, it's kind of, um, it's almost like uh, investment strategy, our Lord is saying. You can spend your money now, and, well, you get your reward, but that's it. But that reward is, is temporary. It doesn't last. It's the kind of reward that the moth and the rust can go after. They have their reward and should expect nothing on the day of judgment. But when you pray, what should you do? Verse 6. When you pray, of course, go into your room. Go into your closet. And you close the, close the door. And you pray again to your Father. Now, again, it's hard to overemphasize how wonderful that is, that we can pray to our Father who is in secret. Now, there, there are different types of prayer. I think it is worth noting that uh, our church, we, we pray in church, we pray together. And there's also a time when we pray, pray alone. Uh, Jesus established this pattern of prayer. He would go out into the desert by himself to pray. He went to the Mount of Olives and he prayed there by himself. So uh, be confident, though, that when you go alone and you get to ask yourself, um, why, this is funny, when you think about charismatics, charismatics, they pray in tongues. Well, why do they pray in tongues? A big part of that is because they like to be seen praying in tongues. And do you remember what St. Paul's advice is there? He says, okay, pray in tongues, but if you do, do it in your own homes. Do it in the closet, pray in tongues that way, or speak in tongues that way. Now, why is that? Because he knows a great reason that they're praying in this way is they want to be shown as being super spiritual. But if you pray in your closet or you pray in your home, well, nobody's going to applaud you then because nobody's going to know about it. Well, this is the way we should think about prayer as well, that it's not, we're praying not to be seen by men, but we're praying in order to speak to our Heavenly Father. And again, there is, it's, it's remarkable. Your Father who sees in crypto, in secret, He will reward you. He will give to you. And again, um, this, is, this is brought up in Matthew chapter 10. There is nothing that's done now in secret that will not all come out in the end. So, um, we do our sins in secret in order to hide them. And of course, it doesn't work. That'll come out in the, on the day of judgment. Uh, likewise, though, we, we pray in secret, but that actually receives a reward uh, because uh, our Lord is pleased with our prayer. This doesn't mean salvation as a reward or in anything like that, but it simply means that we look forward to our Heavenly Father saying the words, well done, good and faithful servant. Now we jump ahead after the Lord's Prayer. We jump ahead to verse 16. And so this kind of fits in when you pray. Now we're told what to pray with the Lord's Prayer. And now we go to kind of more Lenten theme here is when you fast. Now um, as Lutherans were beginning to uh, take up the discipline again of fasting, some people still think of it as a Catholic thing, and that's really unfortunate. Our Lord says when you fast, and um, we do as a church feast. So every Easter we feast. It's great when you have the Easter breakfast that I always look forward to. You can smell the, smell the bacon, and it's cooking while you're in the church. It's really quite wonderful. Um, Thanksgiving is, is, is a feast. I guess it's an American holiday, but we thank God, and it's a great feast. And Christmas, of course, is a great feast. But as the church has times of feasting and of celebration, so also are there times built within the year for fasting. And during the times of fasting, we remind ourselves that there's more to life than eating and drinking. Our Lord says, don't worry about what you're going to eat or what you're going to drink or what you're going to wear. These physical things fade away, and that's the purpose of fasting. 
It's an emptying of ourselves to remember that what really matters is the gift of the Holy Spirit. So when you fast, don't be like, again, the hypocrites, like an actor. I want everybody to see me. And I love this word, skuthropoi. It's like darkened faces. Oh, you know, my woe. We know these kind of people, a drama queen or somebody who always wants to be on stage so that you can come and comfort them. But, oh, what a difficult life I've lived. Well, don't be like this all, but let your faces shine so that you uh, might, so that you might not appear to people. Because if, if, if you let your face shine so that everybody looks at you and as if you're fasting. So if, you're, if, your, face is, uh, so if your face is showing this, well, then you get, you get no reward. So um, they disfigure their face. I tell you the truth, and again, it's the same they, again, they have their, their reward if they want to appear before men fasting. Well, then, then there's nothing for them. But how shall you fast? And again, we shall fast. Um, when you fast, here it's, it's uh, put oil or to anoint your head. So I guess the, well, it would be uh, take your shower, it would be shave, it would be uh, have a smile on your face and, 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 and wash your face. So um, now there is this prickly question, I suppose, about you know, appearing before men. Uh, as part of a number of our Lenten ceremonies, our Ash Wednesday ceremonies, there is a practice of taking the ashes and putting them on your forehead. And then some people say, well, is that showy? I don't think you should worry about that especially in our society, because we live in such a secular world that uh, something like that, I believe, can be a Christian witness. And this is not to say that uh, we walk around and smile and say, look at me. But I think in, in our culture especially, it's important for us to be able to embrace our Christian identity. If we believe that God is our Father, we should be proud to say, I am His child and that Christ is my Lord. So I, th I think the, the idea of ashes on the forehead is still, is still a good idea. And it, it, it makes it easier and easier now to make that argument because you get less and less credit this day for being a Christian. I think in the old days, you know, if you, could, if you would tell people, I'm a Christian, then I think maybe you could be almost expected to be patted on the back or something like that. But I think those... Those days, I believe, are, are over, at least in our culture. Um, so what you want to do is you don't want to phonase. You don't want to shine bef before men in your fasting. You don't, it, you don't want to get any credit before them. But you want to do it, again, before your, your father and, um, and to do it again in, in secret. For your father... Uh, who sees, again, in, 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 in the secret places, um, in, in that which is unseen in this case, well, then he will give you your, your reward. And, um, and then finally, I guess this is really part of, it's really also part of the worship service, isn't it? Um, we have our fasting, we have our prayer, and I suppose the other part that we have then is our, is our offerings to God. And so, so we're told, do not uh, store up for yourselves treasures upon the earth. Now again, uh, we all, it is wise as stewards to save your money. It's wise to invest in the stock market as you see fit. It's wise to plan for your future so that you're not a burden to your children or your grandchildren. But Christians think about money in a different way. They think about it uh, not for themselves, but as a tool in service of the kingdom. They think about money as how can I use it in the best way that I might advance the cause of our Lord Jesus Christ. So there's a place in our church. Uh, the wealthy can do great things with their money. But to do it in such a way as not to bring attention to themselves, but also to remember what money is for. Money is not to be our master. 
It, it is so easily for us. You cannot worship God and mammon. You cannot worship God and money. Now, when you look at this, it says, do not store for yourselves treasures in heaven. Why? Well, we know why, because it's where the, the moth and the rust they can destroy. Um, it's also, it, we know that then the, the kleptos come in as in verse 19. It says that, um, it says that where the thieves, the klepti, kleptomaniac, they, they break in and they klepto and they, and they steal. Now this is kind of the vanity of money. So the vanity of money is that uh, if you store treasures on the earth, it, you can't take it with you. And treasures are temporary. The persons who were the great pharaohs of the past are not great today. The rich, we think of the rich fool who stored up all of his uh, money in, in the great barns that he had. And the Lord said, fool, you don't know that your soul is required of you this night. And then, of course, um, where th thieves come in and steal. I mean, we've seen this in our own society, I suppose, with things like the stock market crash. And people who are uh, millionaires and billionaires on paper are paupers then soon after. So money does, does not last. Uh, instead, we should store up for ourselves, verse 20, store up for yourselves treasures again in heaven. Now this I, it reminds me of the Lutheran hymn, uh, Luther's hymn on the Lord's Supper. We ask that in the Lord's Supper that heavenly minded he make us. So this is an orientation towards the things that matter. Uh, we think of the hymn, Jesus, Priceless Treasure, that Jesus is our treasure. Uh, why? Because this is, if we have this kind of treasure, the treasure that is in heaven, well, nothing can harm that treasure. It's because um, it's where the moth and the rust, so the same thing we had before, the moth and neither the moth nor the rust are able to destroy. And again, uh, where this is the negative part of it, where the thieves then cannot break in and nor can they break in and steal it. And then finally, um, where your treasure is, there your heart is. And uh, this is a gut check for all of us because, again, what do, you th what, what do, we, what do we want out of life? Um, I would say what we want out of life can be found in the Lord's prayer. Uh, we want a kingdom. That is, we want power. We want will. We want what we want. We want what we'd want. And um, we want a big name for ourselves. We want everybody to think we're great. And in the Lord's Prayer, it's all reversed. In the Lord's Prayer, we say, hallowed be the name of you. Let come the kingdom of you. Let be done the will of you. Now, this is a much better life. Um, I've never really seen anybody who's selfish. And of course, we all see our selfishness in us. But when selfishness rules, I've never seen a selfish person actually happy or joyful. Because what makes us joyful is love. And this is the way our God acts. The Father loves His Son. The Son loves us. And we enter into true joy when we enter into communion with that God and we love one another. And when we stop thinking of ourselves, that's when the true treasures come. And thanks be to God during this day of Lent, during this season of Lent, that our Lord spent those 40 days in the wilderness, that he walked the hard road for us, that he went to the cross and he forsook all of the things. Our Lord himself, he didn't seek after earthly glory. He didn't seek after honor. He didn't seek for himself treasures in this world. He was thinking about us the whole time. And now forever, let may the glory be to him. Thank you for uh, being with us this day, and I uh, ask for blessings upon you from our Lord during this season of Lent.